Welcome to What Doesn't Kill Us. I'm Kaya Lark and my guest for this episode was riding motorbikes pretty much from the moment that he could walk. He grew up with a passion for the Isle of Man TT running through his blood. But 21 years ago this month, he spun out on a wet corner and smashed legs first into a stone wall. It was the end of his bike, but not the last time that he would ride the famous track. He was lucky to be alive, but it wasn't the only time that Scott Richardson would defy death. Scott, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. It's really lovely to talk to you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Looking forward to our little chat, Kaya. Now, we can't start any conversation with you without starting it straight into the motorbikes. Um, so were you riding before you were walking? Which came first? Yeah, it was pretty much around the same sort of time. Um, my mum said I didn't really move for about the first 18 months. I was quite a lazy kid letting things be brought to me. Uh, but when I was around two years of age, my dad converted an old uh, rally wisp, which had been in a, an accident, an insurance job. He converted it into a, a little sidecar. A motorbike and sidecar for us to ride around in the garden and it wasn't long before I'd moved from being in the sidecar to, to actually riding the bike uh, with him. My mum's got a press cutting <clears throat> from the local newspaper saying Scott brackets too likes his bikes fast. So I think it was around a similar sort of time that I was walking and riding. Wow so was that your first bike? Too? Like, I was going to say how old were you when you actually got your first motorbike? Yeah so that, that was the first one and uh, I don't think I've been without one ever since right through now to I'm 50 next month, so it's a 48-year run of motorbikes with various escapades along the way. Wow. So, obviously, you, you know, you'd grown up very much with your, your dad on motorbikes all the time, but were your parents ever worried about you riding at such a young age? No, I mean, it's something just the family, all of us in the family did. My mum had a bike licence, dad as well. We used to go on family holidays on motorbikes. And I think in, in their generation, you know, um, my, when my dad was at college, the only mode of transport you could afford was a motorbike. And to, to keep that on the road, because the old British bikes weren't that reliable, you had to you know, work out how they worked and repairing them by the roadside and all that kind of stuff. So f the bikes have always been in the family. And from, that, you know, from his generation through to mine and now my daughter's, uh, bikes just play a big part in in the Richardson household, I think. When you were a teenager, like, like you were saying, you know, motorbikes very much in the family. You'd go on your family holidays. You know, mum and dad both really into them. You as well. But then, when you were thirteen, tragedy struck, didn't it? And and your dad was killed. What what happened there? Yeah, so I was at a scouts um, a raft race in in in, um, in, in Luton, and uh, my mum was with me, and my dad was there on his motorbike on his Laverda. And uh, he said, well, I'm just going off now to, to meet up with some of the guys down at a, a pub down in uh, near Bedford, uh, the Venice Owners Club. So he said, yeah, see you later. Off you go. And uh, he disappeared. And we finished the last, last race there. I think went back home. And at the bottom of the drive was a police car parked on the road. We were just a young police officer in there. We, well, Mum and I went into the house. And a few minutes later, there was a knock on the door. And I got sent up to upstairs. And he uh, you know, I kind of overheard the conversation and realised that my dad, my dad had been in a in an accident and and fatally injured in a in a road traffic accident, not far away from where he was heading to, which you know is a, a shock to say the least. Did did that not at that point kind of put you off motorbikes and and your mum off motorbikes as well? I don't. I never never ever questioned it. I mean, I remember going out into the garage, you know, in absolute tears. And looking through my, bike, my dad's bikes, because he had probably about 15 or 20 different bikes in the garage. And uh, I was, I'd was i sat on each one of them, you know, and had memories talking to myself about, you know, this was your favourite one, Dad, and an old Morgan three-wheeler car that he was starting to restore, and stuff like that. And there's just that absolute affinity to it. And there was there was no resentment or anger to it. I mean, it, it, I guess the bikes had brought us so much joy and pleasure, which is such a big part of our lives that... Um, it just continued on that way. And I, I never really ever doubted that um, I would ride a bike. Maybe I was just trying to prove things to myself or to other people. I, I don't know, not to, to not be beaten by it. I don't, I don't know, really. I've never really analysed it, but um, I, I never had any second doubts about riding. And uh, my mum's never asked me to stop or, you know, urge caution or anything like that. She's been on the back of the, on the bike plenty of times. And as I'm sure we'll cover, she's 
she's come and supported me throughout. Yeah. And I mean, sort of, it was only kind of a couple of years later, really, wasn't it? You, you turned 16 and you got your first sort of moped license and that was it. You were kind of out on the road. Did that kind of give you a real sort of sense of, of freedom? Did that kind of make you feel closer to your dad once again, once you were kind of sort of out, out there on, on your moped properly? Yeah, it was nice to get out on the open road, certainly rather than just going round and round in circles on the field. And uh, I actually took my moped test within a few months, which meant you could still only ride a 50, but you could take somebody on the back. So I used to take my mum on the back of my little Yamaha Fizzy, which would only do 35 miles an hour on your own. So two people up was just hilarious. And But again, you know, mum, absolute salt of the earth. She loved getting on the back of the bike. And uh, we didn't get do miles and miles like it, but it was just, I guess, ticking off another thing that, you know, accepting bikes and and not being not them being a barrier to anything we're, we're and were those away. teenage girls impressed by it too impressed by all that leather <laughs> i don't think so though girls never really impressed in it i don't think at school um it was when you got your first car that's when you became interesting to the yeah, girls yeah I think. true same same for so many across the generations um now <laughs> In 1993, you headed off uh, to the Manx Grand Prix um, for the first time to ride the uh, the famous TT uh, track, uh, the, the famous TT route. Um, you'd been watching that race for years, hadn't you? How, what did it feel like to actually be be doing that route yourself? Yeah, that's absolutely right. We would have a annual, virtual annual pilgrimage to the Isle of Man, either to the Manx Grand Prix or to the TT. And that's with my mum and dad, and we used to stay in a, a small town called Peel in the Isle of Man. And go. And my dad and I would go and watch early morning practice at the nearest point, just after Ballacrain, a, call, a corner called Ballaspur. And uh, just the smell of the motorbikes coming through at like six o'clock in the morning uh, was just phenomenal. What makes it so special, do you think? Well, part of it is, is the length of the race. I mean, it's 37 and three quarter miles one lap and there's about 260 corners I think involved in, in one lap so it's a lot to remember and the races vary from four to six laps so you could be racing for a couple of hours at absolute breakneck speed it's just just phenomenal there's nothing like it in the world uh, you're not racing against you, the other people on the track you're racing against the clock which is quite unique it's a time trial that's what TT stands for so although you may be overtaking people and people overtaking you, it's actually you against the clock. And for people that aren't familiar with the track, I mean, the roads are not very wide at all, are they, in places? No, no, it's, it's nothing. You know, it's no dual, the only dual carriageway in the Isle of Man is outside the airport, and they call it the motorway. It's about 200 metres, I think, as, as wide as it gets in the Isle of Man. But the rest of it is uh, two carriage you know, roads, regular roads. No cat size in the middle of the road, just because they you know, upset the bike handling. You notice that when, you, when you're driving around there. Um, it, it is like no other place in, in the world, you know, the history is 120, 130 years now, and uh, it, it is the ultimate challenge, I think. And you raced it for several years, didn't you? Yeah, so I, I did uh, the Newcomers race, uh, it was at 93, uh, broke down in that first year in the Newcomers race, but finished in the junior race, sorry, the senior race, and uh, then did every year right through till 1999, before they're moving on to the TT in 2000. And then 2000. Now, for many, 2000 was a big year of celebration, millennium year. For you, it was a bit of a bit of a different turning point in your life, wasn't it? Uh, so you're back out, June, uh, racing, you know, racing the TT, and things go a little bit wrong, it's fair to say. Tell me what happened. Yeah, so the Manx Grand Prix is for amateurs, and... Uh, in 99, I finished in fifth place in the senior Max Grand Prix and seventh in the junior. And uh, I remember speaking to my, my sponsor, Colin Moore, in the Isle of Man after the race. And I said, you know what, Colin, that's pretty much as hard as I want to race around here. And I don't want to push it a lot more. Yeah. So we had a bit of a chat. And he said, well, why didn't you? We agreed, you know, I'd move on to the TT because you get paid to do that. It's, you know, it's Racing isn't cheap. So I thought I've got an opportunity here to do the same events, a bit more prestige and actually recoup some money from it um, so we moved up to the TT and uh, I had about six different rides on about four different bikes all lined up uh, just unfortunately on the first lap of the first race I came around a corner of this ballast spur where I used to go and watch with my, with my dad and there was a damp patch in the road <clears throat> and uh, the front tyre lost a and I went 
feet forward into a dry stone wall at about 100 miles an hour. And uh, I remember scrutineering that morning, which was probably about four hours before the accident, and then waking up four days later from an induced coma. And uh, one of the first things I said was, is there any food? Because I felt starving. <laughs> Which is a weird thing, but yeah, so it, it, uh, it unraveled a little bit there. Um, but I was very, very fortunate. There was lots of things acting in, in my favour that really preserved my life. Um, first of all, there was an off-duty German uh, doctor watching at the corner where I crashed. Wow. So he attended to me straight away. And, you know, I'm not saying he saved my life, but if it had been Joe Public, you know, maybe ripping your crash helmet off or moving you could have made things worse so he tended to me straight away and then the the air ambulance came and picked me up <clears throat> and uh, scooted me off to Nobles Hospital and from me being reported as crashed to being in the hospital was, was eight minutes and in that time I'd obviously lost a lot of blood because yeah. I'd severed the artery in my left leg and uh, I actually met the the, uh, the doctor a few months later when I went back to Isle of Man just to shake him by the hand and thank him for saving my life and surgeons are just or doctors are just that strange people he said ah it's all right he said we looked at you we thought yeah this one's probably worth saving chuck him on board <laughs> little did they know <laughs> eh? little did they know scott <laughs> yeah but they got me to the hospital nice and quick and uh induced coma for a little while and then woke me up when i was a bit stabilized and move on from there and you woke up to find out that basically your wife had 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 your leg amputated while you were out she, she she'd kind of agreed when did you find out kind of how quickly from waking up were you told what had happened and, and sort of how quickly did you get a grip of actually how serious your injuries were? Yeah, I remember waking up and looking through the window in the intensive care unit and seeing a few people that I recognised through the window and the family were around me. And it's probably a little bit of a fast forward recollection, but I remember the, uh, the nurse coming up to me saying, well, you've been involved in an accident. And I thought, yeah, it looks pretty serious. I've got pipes coming in and out of me, all sorts of places. He said, and uh, just to let you know that you have lost your leg. And I looked at him and I said, no, I haven't. I can, I can still wiggle my toes. He said, no, really, you have. And I, I lifted up the covers and, yep, you're right. I have lost my leg. Okay. And uh, from that moment on, quite literally, I, I remember thinking, you know, I'm lucky to be alive. This is part two of my life. Crack on from here. And it, it, it sounds maybe hard to believe but I've I haven't had a dark day in all that time ever since I think it's you know if I've been sat at a junction on my motorbike and a drunk driver crashed into me and I'd lost my leg I'm sure I'd have a different perspective mm. on my situation but as far as I'm concerned you know at that point I was the luckiest man alive and I was lucky to be alive and I mean there were people who died that day that you had your accident and, and, and that you were injured, weren't there? I mean, let's, you know, it, it was a real possibility. Yeah, that year, five guys, unfortunately, lost their lives in, in accidents there. You know, and I, I was, it was a blessing that I wasn't the sixth, you know, it's pretty close. And mm. as I guess we'll talk about in a moment, you know, I kind of escaped death a couple of times really in, in, in that month. And I mean, how, just to sort of kind of talk me through that, that recovery journey of, of yours, because I mean, it's quite unusual, isn't it really, to, to not have a dark day after you've been through such a life-changing injury like that. And I mean, I guess, you know, like you say, you were injured doing something that you absolutely loved, that you were so passionate about, but then, you know, was there a moment of thinking, I'm never gonna do that again, or maybe I'm not gonna walk again, maybe I'm not gonna be able to do this or that, or, or, or kind of, how did, your, how did your mindset I guess, kind of get you through that that recovery because it, you know, it, it's not a quick recovery, is it, to come back from that? No, it's not. And I, I you know the patients that I meet when I, I'm at work now, I think your pre-accident disposition has a, a big impact, you know, on 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 how you accept mm -hmm. whatever is presented in front of you. And I think I was pretty much a glass half full sort of person beforehand, and that hasn't changed as you know, a result of all that happened. Um, it's It's just, it's just slightly strange. I, I, I don't really know. You know, I, I had a pretty big bang on the head and sometimes I've, I've used that to, as an excuse when I forget to do things. But, you know, <laughs> sometimes I think, you know, was I like that before or not? And it's a, it's a little bit of a, a grey area. I, I think I'm OK. My memory's not as great as perhaps it should be. But um, 
that's just your age um and actually it's probably worth just just sort of backtracking for a second just i mean tell us obviously that the, the leg is the obvious thing but actually what were your what were the the list of injuries that you you'd suffered yeah so remember my mum was over watching and my wife carol at the time she was there as well with my with two kids so katie was um, about four and holly was uh, just walking so she was about 18 months and uh they had to come in and sign the consent forms, all that kind of stuff. And I remember mum saying to me, saying that when she came to see me, she couldn't believe how large my head was. It was just swollen as hell. She, it was unbelievable. Um, but I had a bruised brain, uh, swollen lung, broken femur in my left leg, broken tibia and fibula in my right leg, lacerations, broken fingers, broken ankle, um, those kinds of things. So, it was, you know, I was really lucky. My legs took all the impact. I had a brand new Harai crash helmet on. And that split from here through to the back and my head didn't even take the impact, you know. So wow. in head first, I guess that would have been curtains, but my legs took the impact and that kind of saved me. In fact, I had a guy contact me a couple of months later. Um, he, he sent me a message and said, uh, do you want your ECU, my, my electronic, uh, electronics box from the, from the, the bike back? And that, that's bolted up underneath the seat of the motorbike. And I said, yeah, why have you got that? He said, oh, it landed in my lap. From the impact, the bike just disintegrated. You know, the exhaust was in the trees, the, the front was snapped off, all that kind of stuff. And my friend who I borrowed the bike from wasn't too pleased when I gave it back to him in a box. But it just showed that you know, the impact was absolutely immense. And uh, I, I was certainly lucky to survive it. Yeah. And, I mean, ultimately, your amputated leg kind of then becomes your, your good leg in a way, doesn't it? It absolutely did, because I, I, I had a metal work put in the in the in the... Uh, fib, uh, fibula in my right leg my whole leg and that got an infection in it and got an abscess and uh, the bone wasn't knitting together so I spent probably the first nine months in a wheelchair then the next nine months on crutches but on my prosthetic side non-weight bearing on my my sound leg while we tried to get that to, to fix up and that took about three external fixators before they eventually um, put me back under the knife and we cut out a couple of inches of dead bone uh, just above my ankle, broke my leg below the knee and then had an external fixator fixed on. And, and I stretched the leg back out a millimetre a day uh, for about six months. Um, we got to a point where everything was getting really tight. The tendons were, were, were getting taut and it was painful. You could feel every turn of the, of, the, mm -hmm. of the spanner. So I went back to see my consultant in King's College, Mr. Green, and uh, he said, how's it going? I said, yeah, it's OK, but it's starting to get a bit painful. I said, uh, We'd stretch back an inch of the two inches that have been cut out. And I said to him, can we not just cut an inch off my prosthetic side instead? He said, yeah, absolutely, do that. So we, I'm now an inch shorter than I used to be, but it meant we could take the frame off a little bit early and save some of the pain. You, you used sport, as a lot of people quite often do um, when they are injured, you know, sort of so catastrophically. Sport becomes quite a big thing as, as part of that rehabilitation, doesn't it, to to sort of, you know, kind of get that mobility back and get some fitness and some, you know, cardio and whatever. You went on to represent the, your country? Yeah, I mean, I was I was keen on sports, but would never dream of representing my county, let alone my country, and end up mm -hmm. going to Thailand to play badminton for England or para badminton. And I've since represented uh, England in disabled golf as well. So when some doors close on you, other doors open. And um, I, I don't, it's not just a positive outlet that you know, these opportunities come along and you have, to, you have to grasp them. And there's some chances that you get that you'd never get as an able-bodied person. So yeah. that's, that's a win-win. But like you said, you did get back onto the motorbike and you did go back to the Isle of Man. Yeah. I, I guess there's one bit we have missed out, which is like... <laughs> The pierce de resistance in all this story, but um, just to backtrack slightly, when um, I came out of my coma, I was just putting us, you know, in, into a regular ward with everybody else. And I was taking pills uh, for the pain and uh, receiving a little bit of physio. They said, "Well, you might as well go back to back home to your family." So we're going to repatriate you back to Luton Dunstable Hospital uh, in a medical evacuation flight. So this was probably about five weeks after my accident. So I'm sat there with my bag on my lap in my wheelchair ready to go and uh, a phone call comes from Luton Dunstable Hospital saying because I was transferred from one hospital to another I needed to go to an isolation ward mm -hmm. and the, the Luton Dunstable Hospital rang and said uh, we haven't got an isolation bed for Scott he can't come so I'm obviously a bit pissed off by this and get pushed back back to my bed and a bit hacked off so 
um, I never went. And it was meant to be, say, a light aircraft with a couple of nurses. So my seat became available. And there was a gentleman who had cut his hand on some uh, architrave, did some DIY at home, and he needed to have some plastic surgery. So he got on with his wife onto the flight that I was due to get on and uh, to go to uh, Liverpool Hospital. And they took off. And when the plane was coming in on finals at Liverpool Airport, the pilot had a heart attack and they crashed into the Mersey and everyone board was killed. And that, that was my ticket. So, you know, I, I kind of escaped death twice in, in a few weeks there. Yeah, absolutely tragic for the family. But I got, I got a phone call from, from, the spon- from Colin, the sponsor, mm. saying, uh, have you bought a lottery ticket? I said, what do you mean? He said, haven't you heard? I said, what do you mean? He said, the plane you're due to be on has crashed. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So I came home the following day on a Manx Airlines scheduled flight across four seats, stretched out like that, having escaped death, you know, twice in succession. Okay. So uh, it's a bit like Final Destination, I think. So you've, 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 you have safely uh, left the Isle of Man. You go on your recovery journey and then you take yourself back. Yes, yeah, so I had to prove myself to the um, ACU, the Auto Cycle Union, that I was safe to ride a motorbike or race a motorbike again. Um, so I had to uh, demonstrate that I, I could ride safely uh, at the circuit. And how, I mean, how soon after you were injured were you back on a motorbike? It would have been sooner, but because of the complications with my sound leg and you know, not having any strength or stability in that, I think it took about maybe three years before I started contemplating that. And then they gave me back my license at a lower level. So I had to get, um, I think, 10 finishes in the top 50% of races at three different circuits to get my national license back. Anyway, done all that. got my license back and, uh, and then decided to head back to the Isle of Man. And they were delighted to see me back there, of course. But um, with the TT, if you, if, so if you race in the TT, you can't then race in the Manx Grand Prix in the modern classes. Um, Although I felt like a controller bike, I didn't want to be going at the same speeds as I was yep. that I had d- done before. So I decided to go back to the Max Grand Prix in the classic races. So I rode, I think it was nineteen seventy one three fifty Honda, which is a lot less powerful, but meant I could hold onto the bike uh, a bit yep. more safely. Red right foot gear change on that, and the island felt a lot flatter riding a, a slower, smaller bike like that. But it, it gave me the opportunity to to lay the ghost to rest because. I'd, I'd been back riding on the road for a year or so and I'd, I'd ride around some corners and think, you know, that's a bit like such and such corner in the Isle of Man and that corner's a bit like there as well. So there weren't demons, but there were just thoughts in the back of my mind mm. that were like reminders, recollections of the Isle of Man. And uh, so I went back to the Isle of Man and uh, competed there and quite honestly, all those thoughts just vanished when I got home. You know, it kind of laid those ghosts mm-hmm. ghost to rest. Were you proving, do you think you needed to just sort of Prove it to yourself. Consciously, I didn't think that. It, um, I, I think part of it was I didn't want to be beaten by the uh, by the circuit. You know, okay. I, I wanted to stop on my on my terms, not let the circuit beat me. And when that year, when I went back, I think there was just over seventy entrants in my race, and I finished fourteenth, uh, uh, which was pretty respectable. Certainly, the mm-hmm. first one-legged guy in, in the field. And I was just outside the 10% of the winner's time, which uh, wins you a, a, a replica trophy. And that's what you know, a lot of races go for, to win the replicas. Yeah. And uh, I was about, I think, about 15 seconds outside of winning a replica. And so I was chatting to a couple of mates afterwards. So well, I'm coming back next year. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to get another replica. And then uh, I've kind of done what I needed to do. I've laid those guys to rest. This place will get me in the end if you know I keep coming back yeah. too much. So I decided yeah. to sock it on there. I carried on short circuit racing, but that was me done with racing at the Isle of Man. Mm-hmm. Um, still been over a few times since, supporting my friends, and I've been due to go over the last two years. But thanks to COVID, not been able to get over yet. But we're, we're due to go over in, in 2022 yeah. um, to have a watch there. So the, the place is still a draw for me, just not not competitively. And there, there's not like a huge desire or not suppressing anything by not racing there and I've kind of done what I need to do and maybe psychologically I think in you know two fingers up to the circuit I'm still alive I'm still here yeah and you've clearly tested out a few of your nine lives along the way <laughs> used up a couple of you need you need to keep one or two in the back pocket just in case don't you um how did your injury and how did that whole kind of 
change then sort of I guess of your your lifestyle and everything and, and everything that you'd been through how did that change sort of every other aspect of your life professionally your family life kind of what, what were the impacts um you know I guess in, in just sort of how you how you viewed things as well and how you approach things did you kind of feel invincible to everything then or were you more cautious I I, I think what it is it's if you think of it like a jigsaw and it's getting those pieces back to make the whole picture up again and that might be riding a motorbike it might be being able to walk it might be doing a, a, a sport that you did before those bits and pieces so slowly my uh, i kind of broke my rehabilitation down into those pieces where it became back pain squash with, with my mates getting the race license all those kinds of things <clears throat> but that all made the big picture you know made it complete uh, and eventually you changed professions as well didn't you You kind of moved m- yeah that's right so we've got um the airline i worked for britannia Airways got taken over by um ha- or chewy the chewy group thompson that was and um we got made redundant and so i've done 13 years at britannia and i finished there on the friday and started on the monday at the limbless association working as an outreach officer there down in, in roehampton london so i'd commute every day on my 600cc scooter from from Dunstable into Luton into Roehampton and that, that in itself became a challenge I'd try and do the entire journey without putting my feet down you know balancing <laughs> a traffic lights and filtering through traffic that kind of thing and I think on one occasion I managed to make it to work and back again without putting my foot down once um, but I'd wear like a motorcycle boot on my sound side but on the other side I'd just have a trainer and you'd pull up at traffic lights and somebody would look across you and think this idiot's just got his trainers on and he'd pull your trouser leg up and you just got a pile on for a, for a shin and then oh, okay fair enough and then I think yeah. what the hell are you doing on a motorbike yeah what, what are you doing back on a bike I, I did get knocked off one time coming back through London and uh, the guard I was filtering down the outside and the guy pulled out across in front of me and trapped me my lip I set it leg between the bike and me and we fell off and we got up and uh, the foot was pointed around like 90 degrees the black goes, oh, your leg, your leg. I said, oh, no, it's all right. That's from a previous accident. God. He's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah, it's clearly not the only person who's thought that along the way. <laughs> um, now, obviously, you know, we, we, we've touched on the, the, the sporting um, success uh, that you had uh, post-injury, um, but there were other opportunities uh, that, are, that have arisen as well uh, since, since your injury and uh, a, a little uh, dabble into the, the, the movie business. Yeah, I, another opportunity came my way. Um, a friend of mine, Bob Monkhouse, is in the military. I somehow ended up on his distribution list we sent an email to a load of military guys saying, lads, get your names down. There's a, uh, uh, an agency looking for amputees for film work. So I thought, well, nothing to lose. I'll, I'll fill in the form online. Sent it in and literally within a week, I get an email saying, um, can you be available at Pinewood Studios for a fitting uh, next week? So, yeah, okay, I'll be there. So I rock up. Are you Scott? Yes. Are you here for your fitting? Yep. <laughs> we didn't know what that was. So at this point, at this point, you've got no idea what you're there for. Not, not a clue. Not a clue. He said, "All right, just give us your camera phone," and he blanked off the lens and got me to sign some paperwork. And then a guy came and collected me and took me through into the side room, and uh, I was confronted with R2D2 and C3PO and Chewbacca all being made in the special effects department. And he uh, said, "All right, you're Scott. All right, let me just." measure you up so they measured me up and said right see you next week for your first fitting in your costume I'm like okay all right what is this and nobody would say what the film was they, they were sworn to secrecy they weren't allowed to say what it was although it's plainly <laughs> obvious what was going <laughs> a couple of clues there yeah. yeah so i remember getting in the car driving home and uh, rang my wife susie and i said uh she said how'd it go I said, yeah yeah it's good she said well, what is it i said oh it's just some small little art house film for I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's called Star Wars, baby. <laughs> She's like, what? Said, yeah, I can't believe it. I can't talk about it. She's okay, okay. So I uh, went through about four or five of these fitting appointments. And then uh, they, they called me to one side. This is Scott. Um, Do you mind if we put some animatronics inside the head that we're making for you uh, to make it a bit more lifelike? I was like, oh, happy days. Crack on. So you what, know. what character, so what, what character were you being fitted to be at this point? Well, I, I, was, I was just one of about 50 guys uh, in sort of uh, background characters in Maz's castle, all various creatures. And there was an alien creature there. 
just literally, you know, one of dozens of people in it. And uh, so they put this guy, Chris, put all these animatronics in the head so it sort of brought it to life. And uh, we had to do like a, a show and tell. And JJ Abrams, adept, came round and he was looking at all the characters and everything. And he sees me in the background with this head munching away. He said, oh, we, we need to feature this guy more. Bring him to the front. Bring him to the front. Actually, um, give him some lines. I'm like, what? <laughs> Pushing past all these actors. Excuse me, excuse me, coming through. Uh, Scott, and, uh, Scott has arrived. Scott is here. Part. Scott has arrived. Yeah. <laughs> were, you, were you like and, this? Uh, I'm just, I'm just going to elbow my way to the front now. <laughs> yeah, just take, take me to my trailer. I'm tired now, that kind of thing. And then they uh, took me to be uh, captured. I said, okay, what's that? And then they took me into this room and there was literally 200 SLR cameras in a, in a, in a circle, like a, a cylinder. They did a simultaneous photograph of me. And I said, what's this for? They said, that's in case they decide to make you into an action figure. I'm like, really? <laughs> and a few months later, when the film came out, my action figure was created. And, you know, I bought the whole stock up. <laughs> them, so that's my, my Star legacy. Star Wars like, God, we've forward. never sold so many action figures. <laughs> <laughs> I went into the entertainer in Aylesbury a while ago, and they had it on special offer. It's down to like a five. And I bought like fifteen of these. I put them on the on the on the on the uh, counter, and the woman started going through. I said, "They're all the same." Hoping she would say, "Well, why are you doing that?" So I could just <laughs> spout it. She just went, "Okay," and just run through fifteen, and that was it. Like, do you have no curiosity why somebody would be buying fifteen of the same? Probably thing? just thinks you're stuck up for a kid's party or something. <laughs> or you're some crazy Star Wars <laughs> obsessive, maybe. Uh, so, that, and that, again, you know, that's another door that's open to me. So. I go and do conventions, you know, prior to lockdown and everything else, um, all around the country, been over to Ireland doing it and to Holland. You know, it's a whole new world. That just, I mean, it's, it's probably not a surprise to the, to the Star Wars fans, but they're just so yeah. fanatical, you know, and, and the fact that you're a fairly obscure character in, in the scene, you know, in the background, that makes you even more collectible to, you know, to the real enthusiasts. Anyone can go and get Mark Hamill's signature if they pay enough, but, to get that fourth stormtrooper on the right, you know, in, in that such and such scene is, is a bit of a coup. And were you so, a Star yeah, Wars good. fan before the movie? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I saw it in 77 when I was six, and then the next time I saw one was at the film premiere. And how, many, how many times? So I had to go back, I've had to go back, had to go back and learn, you know, bone up in it a little bit because, you know, these guys, the, the, the fans know yeah. every single detail and... Uh, they you catch don't you out real the quick. Star Wars fan, do you? <laughs> and how many times have you watched? Uh, have you watched your movie? The Force Awakens, yeah. So it's been on a few times. Um, my wife bought it for me as well, and she she was cabin crew British Airways, and it seemed every time she went to America and turned the TV channels on, there <laughs> it was on. So she felt duty bound to watch it. As I think she's watching wow, more than that me. Wow, that is okay. dedication. That is dedication. And yeah. uh, and you've done have you done other TV and and uh, and sort of on-camera roles as well. Yeah, well, just after that, we uh, got um, called to do Wonder Woman, the remake of Wonder Woman. And hilariously, the first uh, direct, assistant director on, on the film was the same guys on, on, on Star Wars. So I walked onto a set with like, another dozen amputees and Tommy goes, all right, Scott, how are you doing? I said, yeah, all right, Tommy. And the guy just said, how do you know him? I said, you know, we've, worked, we've worked together before. <laughs> got my equity card here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I do that, and then I do a lot with um, casualty resources, being a, either an injured um, military person or with emergency services or the fire brigade, that kind of stuff. And that's real good fun. That's There's some pretty black humour between the guys and girls in that, but that's very therapeutic and supportive for ma mainly, you know, recent amputees. They, they see other people getting on and taking the opportunities to make the most of the amputation and uh, we, have, we have a real good laugh yeah. that, and just cool. opportunities that yeah just just wouldn't be there if you'd if you'd remained able-bodied and 100%. um yeah. i mean we you know we, we sort of laugh about this but actually you know your your professional career took a, a real kind of turn as well didn't it so once you uh, once you were made redundant uh, by the airline uh, and, and you, you know you, you're dabbling off in in Hollywood and going to all your A-list parties um, but actually your, your your kind of solid professional career took a, a, a sort of different turn as well didn't it and uh, and you eventually joined Pace Rehabilitation working with um, a whole kind of range of people really aren't you now who have suffered various life-changing limb loss injuries or, or, or really bad uh, sort of amputations or really bad injuries. Yeah, that was, again was another 
you know, chance happening because when I was working at the Limbus Association, I thought it'd be a great idea to organise an amputee track day at Donington Park, uh, which, which I did, and that went really well. And uh, a couple of the guys who came to that um, were the guys from Pace, and um, an opportunity came up uh, to when they were setting up a second clinic down in the south in Chesham, and uh, I went along for a chat, and they said, hey, are you the guy who done the... The track day at Donington. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, that was a great day. You enjoyed that. And that kind of broke the ice, and uh, that was my in to the to the uh, prosthetic world. I, after Max and I really, you know, I, I fancied becoming a prosthetist. You know, look after your own legs yeah. and stuff. But with two young kids, you know, there was no chance of um, taking four years out to do the degree course and to, to qualify. So this was my way in, and, and um, I absolutely love it. You know, it's an absolute busman's holiday every day. Uh, you know meeting up new patients and quite often they don't realize that you're an amputee and uh, you know get chat with them and you know, maybe they're having a, a, a tough time they say well, you, you know you don't appreciate what it's like and you say well Absolutely, actually yeah. i do and you roll up your trouser leg and they're like oh wow and then they you see their brain working thinking mm. i've met you a few times i've never noticed that you wear a leg you know i want to be and where yeah, you are how, how do that, you think that that helps some of them when they maybe have been or, or, you know, are sort of still struggling if they're relatively new to injury. hundred percent. I mean, normally when you've had, you know, you've had an accident like that, you're getting all this advice and guidance from clinicians and it's yeah. either out of textbooks or the experiences. It's not first-hand experience. So to meet somebody who you know, has been there, done it and kind of got the t-shirt, I think it's, is, is very supportive. I remember one thing when I finally got back to the Luton Dunstable Hospital they sent in a physio to see me. She said, I'm not here to treat you, she said, but they thought it might be quite good for me to meet you. And she was a below knee amputee. And she said, have you got any questions? And I said, yeah, actually, could you just um, use your prosthesis? Could you pump my bed up, make it a bit higher? So she did so. And she goes, is that better? I said, no, it was absolutely fine before. I just wanted to check I could pump the tyres up on my motorbike when I get out of here. She's like, unbelievable. <laughs> always, always still about the motorbike. <laughs> It's, it's a small community, you know. I, I still see, see that physio from time to time, and people that you bumped into, you know, it's 20, 21 years next month since my anniversary, and you, you still come across people that you know you don't see for a few years, and then you pick up old times. It's a, it's a, it's a unique club to be a member of, um, but it, it's, it's not a bad club, mm. certainly. If you could wind the clock back, twenty one years, would you still get on your bike that day? Would you still, still do that race? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Opportunities have come along. You know, we've spoken about them that I would never have had before. You don't know how your life would have panned out yeah. with two legs. But I, my life feels richer being amputee, and um, I don't know what my mental state would be. You know, with, with two legs, would it be any different to now? But I, I feel positive and you know, embrace life. Absolutely, I guess it is that second chance. You know, and it, you know the title of your podcast. It, it's hilarious when you when you when you told me about it because I I remember getting like a get well card from a complete stranger uh, when I was in hospital, and he wrote on there, "What doesn't kill you makes you stronger," and that has been my mantra all that time. So you know, it's so coincidental when you when you mention this in, for your podcast title. Yeah. Yeah, got, got, got to be part of it. Um, well, Scott, it's been an absolute pleasure. You have made me laugh so much. And uh, <laughs> all my misfortunes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes a little bit at you, sometimes with you, but that's fine. Um, but no, Scott, thank you so much for talking to me today. And, uh, and yeah, for sharing your story on the podcast. You're very welcome. Superstar. Thanks a lot, Kai. And a very happy 50th birthday to Scott, who is celebrating his big birthday this month. Now, my next guest, Carla Carlisle, spent years fighting to adopt her son from his abusive family. She endured manipulation and domestic abuse as she tried to free him from his destructive home and save his life. When friends told her to give up and forget about him, she just fought harder. That moment was unlike any other I received this phone call to say, you know, we have this baby, he's two months premature. He was born, you know, with cocaine in his stool. And I said, okay, I wasn't expecting to get a newborn or a preemie. How long do I have to think about it? And they said, like now, we'll move on to the next call. Wow. And so I thought about, 
my niece and nephew who are both preemies. And I just thought, this baby needs me. And I stopped at the local store and got a car seat and some preemie clothes and a couple of other things. And I went to the hospital and that was that. If you like what you've heard so far, then don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment or review. And you can find out more on other social media platforms. Bye.